Well, we don't have 18 visitors. That's what we've been saying about one of our tents, one of the tents in Eden. Remember that, Scott? Last night had 18 visitors and took the tent down. I said, I don't think I can take the tent down. We have 18 visitors. I might have prayed that we didn't have 18 visitors. Whoo, man. Well, that was the landowner out there, and I forgot what I was going to say, but I'll just go ahead and say what he said. He called in to Deborah Buchanan's show the day that the county started in on us, and he wanted to know what was going on. He said, I, that's my land, and I gave the Church of Christ permission to be on it. And he said, what are they doing? And Charles told him. And so his response was, when he heard the end of it, he said, y'all have set precedent for people to get to keep their tent up or yourself to keep it up for 12 days without going through all that hassle because they let you do it this time. We'll see. We did it in 2014, and Mr. Clark, let's say, how do you do in the South? If you talk about somebody, you have, somebody, you have to say, bless your heart first, bless his heart. And we have prayed for him. Caleb prayed for him the night of it, and we have not talked bad about him on television. So y'all pray for him and Mr. Hall and um, for Mr. Cahill. That was very nice of him to go to bat for us. He said he actually talked to the city, I mean to the county, about what was going on. So that's a good note. It's nice to have favor with some people. Acts 247, they were having favor with all men at that little segment. And so it's nice to end tonight that way. Uh, I'm going to save any comments and commendations and things like that towards the end and let Caleb and, and uh, Joey start off. Uh, Tanner, how about you lead us in prayer, please, sir?
Okay. Good evening. Good to see everybody here tonight. Uh, our visitors, we thank you for coming out. We are thrilled to have you here. He's just closing those so that we all won't be distracted by the traffic. We have people like to come and do burnouts, right? Well, we're glad that you're here. I do want to say this before we get going. He's, uh, Dad said we'll save our thanks and, and words like that for the end uh, discussion. What I would like to say tonight is we're, you know, we said we're glad that you're here taking time out of your schedule. For a moment, I would like to say as we get started, when we do this type of work, and I would say I'm, I'm talking to our visiting brethren who came out of here, out here, is I don't know of another place where you could go and you could door knock every day for two weeks, have the preaching every night, be fed in the afternoon, get a chance to have Bible studies. But with that, and I'm speaking for me and for my dad, and he knew I was going to say this, there comes a lot of tension with that right this is some hard work and so really what ends up happening for like the guys down here they're doing all the tech stuff and different ones have been running the door knocking so do you know what ends up happening have y'all been at home and y'all watch like on the evening news y'all see nasa send a rocket into the atmosphere people see nasa send a rocket out into the atmosphere and then they start getting the idea i could give them some tips on how to get that rocket out into orbit and that's like running a tent meeting. This is a whole rocket ship. It's difficult, a lot of tension, but I want to say this. At the end of it, we love you, and we're very, very happy for you to come out and help us with this endeavor. Souls have been reached. The seed has been planted. Uh, a lot of information has been disseminated, and tonight we're closing out with really what is an easy and soft lesson. This lesson is not complicated, uh, but it is an exhortation to get you to think about, I think, really, one of the biggest things that the devil would like you to ignore. This is a unity meeting. This is the last night of our unity meeting. I hope that you've kept a, uh, a notebook of the scriptures that we have referenced. There are a lot of very famous passages in your Bible, and then there are passages that just get overlooked. Matthew 12, 25, Jesus said, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Now, some people would say, nah, Abraham Lincoln said that. It came out of the Bible. And in the religious community, we are not going to be able to do God's real work if we're going to keep having division. And why do we have division? The young man said to Ian door knocking, we have division because of principles interp of interpretation and we have variation of doctrine. That's why people, when we're door knocking, we hand them a flyer, they say, thank you, I have my own church. No, thank you, not interested. You're still invited. We'd like for you to come out and have Bible study. And the reason we're doing this is because we're having an education meeting. A big part of education, whether people liked it or not, I don't know if you liked history when you went through school. When I went through school, I did not like history. As an adult, I, I now enjoy history. I think probably everybody says that. I hated school when I was a kid. Now that I'm an adult, I like getting information. This is in your Bible. A lot of people don't know it. So... When we go out talking to people with the religious division that's out there, you know, a lot of people, whatever sect they're in, they'll say, young folk, young folk growing up don't know the Bible. Well, what do they do for them? Nothing. They're not trying to teach young folk about stories from the Bible, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Moses, Abraham. Who knows who these people are? Well, if you look in 1 Corinthians 10, Verses 1 through 6, Paul expected us to know who these people are. You've got to know your Old Testament history. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our examples. You got to know the example so that you can get your life patterned after it, right? Well, tonight, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to do some wilderness wandering. It'll be very easy. We shouldn't be here too long, but I think it will be of great value. Tonight, we're talking about heading to the promised land. You probably already know where I'm going with this. I'm not trying to get you to book a cruise to Israel. I don't want you, I don't care about going to see Israel. 
So when we start talking about heading to the promised land together, what are we talking about? We're talking about being in eternity with each other. In this business, I'm saying, you say things like that, I'm talking about being in eternity with you, right? People say, I don't want to spend eternity with them folk. If you got that attitude, you're probably not going to be on the good side of eternity. Personalities are not going to ruin heaven for me. And if we have that mindset, and let's talk about this, y'all, there are religious people who I, I once got a text message on my phone. I've never met this man. He texted me from Connecticut, and he's what they call an independent fundamental Baptist. And he said, one of the greatest joys when I get to heaven, he said, is I'm going to hear God tell you, Caleb Robertson, you can't come to heaven. I said, that's a, that's a poor experience of going to heaven. <laughs> I don't even know you, and you're like banking on me going to hell. That's horrible. I don't want anybody to go to hell. And somebody says, well, don't you think people are going to hell? I think that they are going to hell. I wish that they would not. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Now, let's look at our Old Testament. Number one, as we talk about this, people got to get their mind right on God. In Exodus 2, 23 and 24, it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now, we've looked in previous nights, the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. God does not want us to have a hard time. He gave us his, his Bible so that we could pattern our lives and avoid hardship. Some things are going to happen to you. You're just not going to have any control over that. But if we're following the Bible, we should be able to avoid mistakes. But these people who were having a hard time outside of anything that they did, right? They're just being born into Egyptian bondage, and they cry out, and God hears their groaning, and he gives them this promise. In Exodus 3, 8, he says, I come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out up out of the land unto a good land, a large a land flowing with milk and honey, and unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, this was their promise. God hears their groaning. God loves these people. He, does God love the Egyptians? He gave them a chance. They just didn't go through with it. He sees these people. He loves them, and he says, I'm going to give y'all a blessing. Tonight we're talking about headed to the promised land. In Hebrews chapter 4, look at what he says. This is New Testament talking about the wilderness wandering in the promised land. Look at what it says. He says, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left of us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into a rest, as he said, I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter not because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, and this is Jesus in this text is going to be Joshua leading the people into the Old Testament. If Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of of another day? There remains, therefore, a rest of the people of God. If I'm not trying to get you to book a cruise to Israel, what am I talking to you about when I say we're headed to the promised land? 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4. Tonight, we are talking about going to heaven and how to get there and what it's going to take. What did it take in the Exodus? That's the information that we're talking tonight about. But I have to say this to you. You know, if you read old literature and you see people who had ideas about the promised land, do you know some of the most, I'm saying, whether it's we've documented people's verbal stories or if things were being written down back then, do you know when a time in our history where people had the idea of the exodus in the promised land and it was very, very profound in their thought, very uh, prevalent in their thought, during the time frame of American slavery, you would have a lot of literature about 
Exodus, promised land. And there's all kinds of accounts, and I don't know if anybody in here tonight has read Uncle Tom's Cabin. The beginning of Uncle Tom's Cabin, there's a slave, and he's a, he's a very well-thinking man. He's very industrious, and he starts succeeding. And the white plantation owner sees that he's being successful, and he hates it. And so the plantation owner starts asking around, and he says, what is it that this one particular slave really enjoys? And it starts getting back to the plantation owner. He's, they all say he really enjoys this one dog. And so in the book, the plantation owner comes out, and he tells the slave, he says, I want you to drown the dog in front of me, and I'll watch. You, you watch movies, you read books, and there's all this information of a people who are highly oppressed, and the thing, the biblical thing that stands out to them is the Exodus and the Promised Land. Y'all, that theme does not stand out to us today. Why? If you're not in the land of milk and honey right now, I don't know what is. We are so prosperous inside of America. And I hope you don't think, here it comes. I, but really, we've been saying this in your lesson, like my teacher said, let me talk to your heart. We have so many blessings, y'all. And I would say, like, some of our things to the point that even make us sick. I've got all kinds, I don't do it like I used to, but a bunch of people used to tell me, you should not be drinking so much Coke and Dr. Pepper. I'm an American man, right? Fourth of July coming up. Everybody's going to have a cookout. Everybody's going to have a good time. And it's like all these things that we get to do as America because we got money coming out our nose. We're doing so well. And, and what happens when you're doing well in America and you get sick? You got insurance and you got good doctors. And they basically allow you to live the way that you want to live. We're doing so well. Who has time to think about heaven? Who has time to think about the promised land? So can I talk to you about the promised land? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. So I got to tell you, some folk who are going to watch this and some people who are here tonight, uh, I, am, I am different than a lot of folk. And what I mean by that is uh, I was raised by Christians. I was born in a third world country. I've seen how other people are living. I've been able to go outside of a third world country. And I'm married to a Christian, so we get to have uh, these types of conversations. So the promised land leaving, going to the land of milk and honey. Do you know how you get to the promised land? You got to die. And nobody wants to do that. And anytime anybody talks about dying, it's like, oh, no, no, don't do that. Don't talk like that. You ought not say such. Why? You see people get old and feeble. They don't have quality of life anymore. You see people who are just going through hardships, and someone says, Hang in there, your day's coming. Maybe not. I may just live a hard life and die. You know, one of the, I'm telling you, we've had these conversations amongst ourselves, and tonight I'm encouraging you to really think about heaven and wanting to go there. I talked with athe atheists recently out on the sidewalk. They're having a protest. And I said, what do you guys think about the divorce rate in America? And like they're, they're, promo they're out there protesting like, moral injustices. I said, what do y'all think about the divorce rate in America? And they, what? what? I said, the divorce rate in America, what do y'all think about that? I said, kids being raised without a daddy, they don't know right from wrong, they grow up, they go to jail, they make more babies, they don't know right from wrong. I said, it's a process and nobody's talking about it. I don't know, we're just out here to close down this ice cream shop. They had no thought on the divorce rate in America. Whatever drug rate, murder rate, and people, some people say, oh, it's bad, and some people don't even bat an eye at it. Why? Because it's not interfering with their milk and their honey. One of the biggest problems that we have is that people are not thinking about going, they don't want to go to heaven, and they're not afraid of going to hell. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. So let me just talk with you if I can give you just a little bit of anecdotal things. Because I'm sick, one of the biggest things I can recommend to you is to get a colonoscopy. And I was talking the other day. We had house guests during this tent meeting. Joe, 
his brother and his brother's name is Keith and Keith's wife Betsy and I asked all of them I said any of y'all had to be put under for like a surgery Betsy I think had to be put under for her wisdom teeth Keith had to be put under for a shoulder operation and I said what'd y'all think about it Keith said I can't remember it Betsy said I did not like it I said why did you not like it and Betsy said I didn't like that moment where they hit me with it and she said I couldn't do anything anymore she said I did not like that you can't move. It's just coming all on you. Y'all been put under for anything? And she said, what about you? I said, I love it. They tell me. They say, here it comes. And I, they say, okay, here it comes. And I have laughed every time. I start looking around. I'm looking at like that exit sign. That exit sign starts moving everywhere. I love it. And I have said, if that's what dying is going to be like, that ain't nothing. And you know why someone says, boy, this sounding weird. I am a Christian, and when I die, I'm going to heaven. And we have conversations amongst ourselves where we say, what do you think heaven is going to be like? And I have all these ideas about what I think heaven is going to be like. And my wife says, I think that heaven is going to be so outside of what we are accustomed to here that you won't even care about the things you care about now. The things that I say, heaven will probably have this, and she'll say, it probably won't. It will be just be so much better. Here's the next thing about you have to die to get to the promised land. Everybody's terrified of dying. You're lying if you just say I'm not. You can adjust yourself and get ready for it. Uh, we were talking the other day, and I don't know, oh, it was me and Kathy. We were talking the other day, and then I told Joey. When I was 12 years old, we had a car accident, very, very bad car accident, me, my brother, and my two aunts. And as I started thinking about it, that was 15 years ago. And to this day, we were, I guess we were sitting still, and a man who was pulling a, a trailer down the road, he was speeding in a work zone. He hit, hit my aunt's SUV. We all flipped. I think the car flipped twice. And to this day, I don't remember tire screeching. I don't remember the moment of impact, any of it. I just remember waking up in the ambulance, and they said, do you know your name? And I, I said my name. They said, who's the president? George Bush was the president. And then I said, where are we? And somebody said, you're in Hickory, North Carolina. I said, how did we get here? But here's my thing. I had no clue we had been hit. So if I was dead, I didn't know it yet. Everybody thinks about being in a car accident. You die in a car accident. You say, well, what's that going to be like? I'm not one of these people who's like, I died and I came back. But I'm telling you, I had like a level four concussion, and I had no clue what was going on. Last thing I remember before the crash was me telling my aunt I was 12 and I was mouthy and she talked trash to me. The last thing I remember before the wreck was me telling my aunt at Taco Bell, you cannot come to my parents' house. Look, y'all, we don't know what that is going to be like and what the transition is going to be like, but I can guarantee you don't want to miss it. So we might as well be wrapping our heads around these type of discussions and be fixing our mind on this is where we want to be. And it's going to happen to you sooner or later, so what can you do about it? Get ready for it. It's in heaven reserved for Christians. Now, how? Right? We've got the idea of, I think we'd like to go to heaven. You say, well, we're doing so good. We don't, we don't really feel like we need to. Don't you know good can go away just like that? Now, I was a kid again. I don't really remember 2008, but I do remember a lot of people scrambling in 2008. Y'all start having a 2008 again, and then some, y'all be thinking, we're doing real good. Y'all, it can go away so fast. Exodus 3, so how do we get into the promised land? God told Moses, go and gather the el elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. I have said I will bring you up out of the affliction of the Egyptians unto the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and shall say unto them, The Lord God of, of the Hebrews has, sent, has met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Now, we've talked about what our promised land is. We're about to look at how they entered into their promised land, and then we're going to talk about entering into ours, just so you know where we're going. But I have to say this to you. Here was the plan. How are we going to the promised land? Well, first off, we're going to have to take a three-day journey. If people 
in 2021 could go back and talk to Moses before the Exodus, do you know what they would say? Here's the plan. We're going to go out. Three-day journey. You mean I got to walk out there? That's a lot of work to get to the promised land. You want me to do something? And you might be saying, who would say that? One of the biggest Baptist churches in Virginia would say that. Jerry Falwell's Baptist Church, which is called Thomas Road, Jerry Falwell Sr. died in 2007, and his son Jonathan took it over. Jonathan is now the pastor at Thomas Road, and here is their, ba uh, their belief section. Can I pause? To our visitors, I don't know if you're Baptist or not, but can I say this real quick? You might say, I don't like him talking about Baptists. There are, there are churches all around here who talk about me on a regular basis. It does not hurt my feelings. They don't agree with me. And I would say they don't agree with what the Bible says, but they talk about me, and it's not keeping me up, and it, we're going to have to do it. Let's talk about this, too. If you're Baptist and you don't really like this right now, does your Baptist preacher talk about Mormons? Does he talk about the Jehovah Witnesses? Then let's talk about Baptists, and I'll be fair just for a second. Look what the Baptist church is saying. Biggest Baptist church in the area, Thomas Road. They say, we affirm that each person can be saved only through the work of Jesus Christ through repentance of sin and by faith alone. Now, I'm just going to tell you, we'll come to it later. Faith alone, salvation by faith alone is not in your New Testament. That is a false doctrine. We'll get there. Just hang with me. But look at what they say. I'm going to promote from the Bible you do have to do something to be saved. And Thomas Rhodes is going to say, you want me to walk out of Egypt? I'm, going to, I'm just going to have my exodus by faith alone. I believe that God can lead an exodus, but I'm not walking. Can he do it? Sure. I'm not walking out of here. That's too much work. Now, let me show you something before we move on. They say, Thomas Road Baptist Church says that people are saved by faith alone. Look what else they say on their belief section. They say, we affirm that a church is a local assembly of baptized believers. <laughs> in their salvation section, do you have to be baptized? No. To be in the Baptist church, do you have to be baptized? Yes. What does that mean? It's harder to be in the Baptist church than it is to die and go to heaven. What type of sense does that make? Zero. About as much as this. Anybody in the Exodus saying, we've got to walk out of here. That's too much work. You want me to be baptized in water? That's too much work. I'll be saying I earned my salvation if I did that. I, I'm telling you, I'm 27, so I still got some time to go if I live. I've never heard anybody say they earned salvation by being baptized. I obeyed the gospel, but I'm not saying to God, you owe me, God. Why? Because I let another man put me underneath the water. My faith, right? Colossians 2.12, my faith is what caused me to be baptized, and the blood of Christ is applied to me when I'm baptized. Here's one more point. Look at what the Old Testament says. They had to take a three-day journey out into the wilderness where they were going to sacrifice, and it says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Now, from somebody from 2021, if they talked to Moses, first they said... We got to walk out of Egypt. And then they're saying this. Y'all can walk out, and then what? Then you're going to have to start fighting all these Canaanites. Why? Just so that you can say, well, we delivered ourselves. We killed seven nations. We delivered ourselves, not God. Do you think that those people would have gone out of Egypt if it weren't for God? They were in bondage. They weren't just going to pick up and leave. And they certainly weren't. If you keep reading in Exodus chapter 3, these people don't know anything about war. Y'all ever hear people who don't know anything about war tell you what they would do if they were in the military? And you're sitting back saying, this idiot. These people don't know war. The Bible says they don't know war. So someone says, y'all want me to walk out into the wilderness so that we can start fighting with people when we don't know how to make war. Sounds like y'all working y'all's way to the promised land. Who reads their Old Testament and thinks that? Who reads their Old Testament and thinks that Moses and the entire nation of Israel thought that God owed them the promised land? They said, thank God that he has granted us this opportunity, and that's what I'm trying to communicate tonight. 
people are out here saying, you don't do anything for salvation. Where is that in your Bible? And please, please don't, don't treat me like I'm just so ignorant and say, and say John 3.16. I know John 3.16 is in the Bible. Look at what Jesus said here. All, he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. What does he expect them to learn of him? The Christian lifestyle. Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7, Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies, be good to your neighbor. If you get married, stay married, right? Somebody says, well, you don't have to do anything for salvation. He told the people to come to him. You're going to have to do something, and the question is, how do we come to Jesus? This is what Jesus said. This is super easy. I would hope that you have a pen and paper. Every, you say, I don't need a pen and paper for this. Everybody believes this part. John 8, 21. Let's talk about the promised land again. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and you will seek me, and you shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. Let's pause for a second. There are a lot of people who don't think that you go to heaven when you die, even if you're a Christian. Y'all have Jehovah Witnesses come by your house? We had a Jehovah Witness come study with us, and she bemoaned to me. She said, she said my girlfriend's teenage son, she said, in town, he steals, sells drugs, living ungodly. And I said, so what? You don't think he's going to hell? Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in hell. And she said, you're right. And I said, so it's nothing to him, is it? And she said, well, he still needs to get right. You know, Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in going to heaven either. They think they're going to be on earth forever. Where's Jesus? He says, where I go, you're going to die in your sins, and where I go, you cannot come. He went to heaven. Acts chapter 1, the idea is we go where he is. He said, I said, therefore, unto you, you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. You do have to believe in Jesus. You have to believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, that he loves you, he was raised on the third day, and that he gave us the New Testament, built his church. You have to believe in him. Nobody's disputing that. Look what else he says, Luke 13, 3. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You're going to have to change your life, Right? Somebody comes in and they say, well, I'm struggling with some stuff. I hear you. You're struggling with some stuff. But that's a lot different than the person says, that's just me, and y'all can take it or leave it. That person is not repenting. I understand that you're human and you're struggling. All manner of stuff's got its hooks down in you, and you're trying to get it out. I get that. But Jesus says we have to try. You're going to have to repent. Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. If you read Acts chapter 8, the eunuch, y'all know the eunuch, before he's baptized, he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We take people's confession before we immerse them. You know, there is a bit more to confessing Jesus than just saying right before your baptism, I believe he's the Son of God. Will you tell people that you are a Christian? Will you tell people you are a member of the body of Christ? Or do you have Sunday church friends, and then you got weekly worldly friends and you're out with your worldly friends and you run into your Sunday friends and they start saying we didn't know you went to church you're not really confessing Christ you got some secret discipleship going on but you're not really confessing anything now we all agree with this believe repent confess this is what Jesus said right before he went back into heaven he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved he that believeth not shall be damned now here's all I'm saying and I'm not trying to be ugly the Baptist group recognizes there's something to water baptism because they put it on their belief page. You have to be baptized to be a member of Thomas Road Baptist Church. You can't get in their membership without being baptized. Why don't we just all go ahead and teach the truth that you're really not getting into the promised land unless you've been baptized? Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I have talked with Baptist preachers from all over who call into what does the Bible say, and they always rewrite this passage. They say, he that believeth is saved and shall be baptized. That's not what that verse says. If you want to be saved, your salvation comes after a person is baptized. Now let's pause. We want to go to the promised land. We want to go to heaven. We look at them 
in their exodus and going into their promised land, they had to go out. So, you know, that people had the option to stay back in Egypt, didn't they? You don't think that there were some people that when they started hearing about the exodus, they said, y'all can try, but when y'all don't make it, I'm going to be back over here and the Egyptians won't be mad at me. They had to have the faith to leave. They then had to go to war. And if they had to do something to make it to their promised land, why is it so unbelievable that we have to do something to make it to the promised land when he says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? Now let's look at this, y'all. Somebody says, Caleb, you're putting God in a box. My God can save anybody that he wants to. They say, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Do you know what you would have told Moses? Moses said, we're going in the wilderness, and then we're going to the promised land. And somebody would have said, Moses, you're putting God in a box. My God does not need me to leave Egypt. He can turn Egypt into the promised land. He could. That's not what he said he's going to do, <laughs> right? Someone says, well, I believe that God is going to just turn this whole place into the land of Canaan. That's not how this works. He is commanding us to go out into the wilderness and then go to the promised land, and we're going to have to do this if we want the blessing. Y'all, you're going to have to do something. It's all over your New Testament. Can I say what we're not really saying, what a lot of people would falsely accuse us of saying? You have to do something to be saved does not mean you have to be sinlessly perfect to go to heaven. Somebody says, well, I hear what y'all are saying, but your standards are just so high, I can't live that way. Nobody is really living to the standard. And that's why we need the blood, because we're recognizing there are times when I don't meet the standard. And then I say, thank God for the blood. So if you're out here tonight or you're watching on the Internet and you say, well, I just can't meet the standard, you've got to stop saying that because you never heard it from us and you never got it from the Bible. Jesus saves imperfect people. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father. Acts 10, 34, this is Peter. He says, God's no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Paul says this in Acts 26, number 20. He says that he showed to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do work, meet for repentance. Jesus said you have to do something. Peter, Paul said you got to do something. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 talks about Jesus, the author of our eternal salvation. Unto all that obey him. You have to do something to be saved. James 2, 19 through 24. You believe there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe and they tremble. James says, will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Remember earlier we said we get to it. Faith only is not, faith only for salvation is not in your Bible. Faith only in your Bible is when it explicitly says you're not saved that way. Folk out here just, you know, they have a car crash, and somebody runs over and said, they grab their hand and say, do you believe in Jesus? I, they might already be gone by then. They're mumbling stuff to you. And somebody said, well, I, I think they said that they believed. Your Bible says that's not enough. Some, somebody's now stopping me, and they said, that is, that's hard and unmerciful. Wait a second. Did they not have their entire life before that car accident to, quote, give their life to God? Yes, they did. Was that not God's mercy that they came into a world where Jesus had already been crucified, the New Testament has already been delivered, the church is established, they had every opportunity in the world to give their life to God. They chose not to, and basically death caught up with them. We all, somebody told me, they said, well, I'm just going to play my cards with God and see how it goes. Everybody's playing their cards. Some people make a choice to follow God, some don't. I hate it for the people who don't. That's why we just had a two-week tent meeting, right? Because we've been inviting people out to come out and follow the Lord, Matthew 11, 28, the way it says. Now let's talk about this. You've got to do something. We're fixing to make a transition in our lesson, okay? You want to go to the promised land. You recognize we have to do something to go to heaven, which is the promised land. Can I now talk to you about some Jewish history? 
Hebrew history. Do you know what headed to the promised land? Do you know what Israel's biggest problem was as they were headed to the promised land? Somebody, you have read your Old Testament, and somebody's going to say the Canaanites were their biggest problem. God bless you for even knowing who the Canaanites are. There's all kinds of people who don't even know who that is. The Canaanites were not their biggest problem. The Exodus happens in Exodus 14. By Exodus 17, they're already having a big, huge battle, and the Lord delivers them. The Canaanites are not their problem. Then what is their problem? What's the Jewish problem on the way to the promised land? It is infighting. Do you know what I mean by that? So do you know what this is? What is the Exodus? It's a whole bunch of family going on a road trip together. Do you know what that means? How are y'all's family road trips? Somebody put a video on the internet, and it's a, it's a dad. He goes around the car. He says headlights are good, wipers are good. He kicks the tire. Tire's good. Everything packed. And he's going check, check, check. And the last thing on the list, it says unnecessarily angry. And he checks, and then he starts going with everybody in the car. This is a 40-year road trip with your family. You say, I don't want, don't put me in the car with them. Man, our road trips used to be like that all the time. Please. Don't put me, when me and my brother started being able to drive, people be in my parents' car, one of us have our own car, everybody be saying, can I switch cars? In fighting. What has this unity me meeting been about? Stop fighting about these traditions that y'all made up that the Bible never talked about. And what we say earlier, the divorce rate, the drug, what all the drug stuff that's going on in town, murder rate, man, y'all. While we've been door knocking over on West Fayette, somebody got shot and died Sunday afternoon at the apartment complex in West Fayette. Why? The news just said they were arguing, then they shot him. That's bad. That's so bad. What are we doing about it? Nobody's in the town doing anything about it. In fighting. Here's the history. Get ready for this. Do you know Exodus 32? Moses is up on the mountain. And while, before he can come down off the mountain, he's been there for 40 days, and the people said, 40 days? Who knows what happened to this guy? So they say to Aaron, build, make us a golden calf. And Aaron says, okay, y'all give me all your jewelry. I'll melt it down. We'll make a calf. Who is Aaron? Aaron is Moses' brother, and he is kin to all these people. Who was the problem in Exodus 32? It wasn't anybody on the outside. It was the inside. It was Aaron. That's Exodus 32. Do you know what ends up happening at the end of Exodus 32? Moses comes back down from the mountain. He sees what they're doing. These people are fornicating. You know that word? They had an idol, and then they all started fornicating. Moses throws the tablets down, and God says to Moses, y'all need to basically pick sides. Who wants the idol? Who wants to be with God? And some people still said, we'd like the idol. And do you know what they had to do in Exodus 32? They killed thousands of people that day. Inviting. You got it? Numbers 12. <sighs> Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman which he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the anger of the Lord, we skipped a few verses, the anger, anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. The cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. So, what's happening now? The Canaanites are coming. No. It's Moses' brother and his sister. And what are they doing? We, I say this every time, y'all. Do you think that American culture has any value if it starts messing with the Bible? You say, well, that's our culture. We don't know any better. Let me tell you something. You get married, y'all need to work on your marriage. You need to stay married. Y'all going to have kids, you need to work on your kids. If you have fa get ready for this. This ain't no joke. If you have family members that start hating on your spouse, you need to tell your family members, drop dead. Now, wait a second. 
Your family members will drive a wedge between you and your spouse real quick, and God is wanting you to stay with your spouse. You say, well, I just don't know about this. You know good and well that family members will get together, and those, I, I don't mean anything by this, but I've just been seeing, and I, I, I just can't keep it to myself anymore. And they start talking trash about the person who you made covenants with to be together till y'all die. You're going to have to start Xing that stuff out. And you might say, well, I just don't know about that. Did God not do it right here? They're talking trash about another man's wife, and God showed his disfavor. That is not good practice in fighting. And it always looks that way. You just, whatever it is, I just, I can't help but notice, and I just want to blah, blah, blah. They make all type of way to run folk down and throw them underneath the bus. You find it here in fighting. Number 16, now Korah, the son of Ezar, the son of Kohath, look at this, the son of Levi, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, son of Pelah, and the sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation of men of renown. They said the exact same thing from back in Numbers 12. Why is Moses so exalted above everybody else? Do you know who these people are? Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they are all sons of Levi here. Do you know what that makes them to Moses? They're cousins. Your cousins can get you into all type of trouble, but that's not what we're really talking about tonight. I'm saying you've got to make some choices on who your friends are in fighting. First it was his brother, then it was his brother and his sister, now it's his cousins. Do you all know this? This is where the earth swallows up Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. God showed his disfavor in fighting. He does not like it. Numbers 25, 1 through 3, Israel abode in a place called Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. The people did eat, bow down to their gods, and Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. These are not exactly Israelites. Do you know who they are? Israel came out of Abraham. Do you know who Moab came out of? Moab came from Lot, which is Abraham's nephew. They're relatives. They're just not exactly inside of Israel. And all these re relatives on this 40-year road trip, all of them infighting, and that's their biggest struggle. Now, let me talk to you. What does any of this mean? Really, you know, like I had said on TV, we're not preaching at you. I'd like to think that we're all talking with each other. Does this make sense? It's infighting. It's their biggest problem. You can look at your book and you can see Israel and say, boy, this is bad. This is so distasteful. This is not good. But if we look at our community, what do we say? We say, what is it? Variety is the spice of life. We say, let's go along to get along. Let's agree to disagree. Somebody looks at these folk in the Old Testament and they say, poor wandering Jews, God help them. Do you know God did help them? And this is how he did it. He gave them a law. They shouldn't have been doing all that stuff to each other. In Deuteronomy 4, 8, he says, What nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? They could have done better. They had the chance to do better. They didn't obey the law, and they had all kind of infighting. Romans 3, 1, What's the advantage of being a Jew? Much every way chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. That means in the Old Testament time, they had the scriptures. That's how God helped them. And if you look at the Exodus account, he gave them that law real quick. Exodus 19.1, in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. You read verses 5 through 8. This is where they make a covenant with God. God says, if you keep these laws, he says, I'll be with you, you'll be my people. And all the congregation answered, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. They had the law. They had the information. He gave it to them real quick. Now, let me ask you this question this evening. What do you think the answer is to the divorce rate and the drug problems and the murder rate and everything else that we got going on? It's our elected officials. It is you talking to your neighbor. It is you letting people get in your business 
and you trying to give Bible advice to other people. Y'all, we are surrounded by a lot of people who honestly, genuinely do not know any better. It doesn't make what they're doing okay, but they don't know any better. They just say, we never thought about doing things differently. Now let's look at this, y'all. You should be helping these people. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. How's God helping us today? The Bible. Who's reading the Bible? <laughs> it seems like nobody. And you be honest now. You don't really get credit for keeping a Bible on your bedside table, do you? I got it. You tell them. I say, I got it, Pastor. I got it right by my bed. And you don't read it. Coffee table. It's on the coffee table, Pastor. And you don't read it. Y'all. We should be getting people in their book. How are we going to get people in their book? Having Bible conversation with them. Where is your church in the Bible? How are you going to heaven? Do you even believe in heaven? That's what people need to be asked. Do you even believe in heaven? Now let's look at this, y'all. We've got a law just like they did, and it's fantastic. 2 Corinthians 3 says it's even better. Look at this. We're going to skip that one. Today's infighting. Why is it that we can see so clearly the infighting when we looked at Exodus 32? Right? We looked at Numbers 12, Numbers 16. Why can we see that and say, that's bad? They were together. They were on that, that trip together for 40 years, and they were fighting all the time. That's bad. Here's today's infighting. People are not making Christians. They're making Roman Catholics. And what do Roman Catholics believe? They believe in the church's authority, the Roman church's authority. They believe in the Pope. They do not believe in the Bible. I, you know, at some point... <sighs> We've got carpenters under here. We've got school teachers under here, engineers, uh, electricians. At some point, I'm going to say, I have talked to more Roman Catholics than a lot of the people in this community. They do not believe the Bible. They believe in traditions. They do not believe in the Bible. They can't show us the things that they do. They can't show us infant baptism in the Bible. Now, let's keep going. They're not making Christians in the community. They're making Calvinists in the community. Who's doing that? The Presbyterian sect. We got two of them in town. There might be another one in Collinsville, Forest Hill Presbyterian, and I can't remember what the other Presbyterian is called, but it's in the same neighborhood. You're not getting the Bible over there. You're getting the Westminster Confession of Faith with the Roman Catholics. You're getting catechisms, and you're getting all type of tradition. They're not making Christians, they're making Lutherans. I think we got two Lutheran sects in town, and I, one of my neighbors is a Lutheran. And she, she complained to me. She said, we do, we do a lot of good things. She said, we give away clothes, we give away food. And she said, but we do not talk to people about faith. You can't be a Lutheran and talk about the faith. Why? Because you're not even calling yourself a Christian. You're following a man, Martin Luther. And what was Martin Luther? Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic. Born in sin, sprinkling babies, all and I'm saying y'all, if you're gonna be if you're gonna be Lutheran, you're gonna have Luther's small catechism or you're gonna have the Book of Concord. They're not making Christians, they're making Pentecostals. They're making charismatics. And we could do this all night. They're not making Christians, they're making Baptists. They're not making Christians, they're making Methodists, right? We could do this all night. Why do we have so much division and infighting? I got a Bible. You got a Bible. I want to be honest. You should want to be honest. There's no reason to say, like, let me go back to this, y'all. We've got carpenters and electricians in here. Now, when you're doing the basics of carpentry, which is, what do they say? Measure twice, cut once. They... How, how you guys always get the same measurement before y'all start cutting? Same standard. Now, why is it that we can't take the same standard and get the same outcome? You're building a house. You get all type of people coming over, contractors start doing work, and you show up one day and don't nothing in your house match. Why? Well, if we could basically say about carpenters, one day you got a Roman Catholic carpenter, and the next day you got a Presbyterian carpenter, and they don't use the same standard. And you know what you'd be doing? I'm going to fire both of them. But you take it on Sunday. And guess what? Everybody's biblically illiterate in the community. Y'all, we got enough buildings that are called church buildings, so why is it that we can't do any better? They're fighting over... 
they are fighting over the piano that is not authorized in your New Testament. There are plenty of people, I'm a Christian, I can't find the piano for worship inside of my New Testament. Paul didn't do it, Peter did not do it, Jesus did not do it, and they did not tell us to do it. So I don't know where y'all got it. And someone might say, well, that's just you. It's really not. If you start looking at history, and history really doesn't carry weight, I'm just saying, people historically did not use the piano either. 1800s, it started really coming in, and guess what? We got all these church bands today. It's not helping anything, is it? It sure has divided a lot. I'm out door knocking in Danville. I, you know, you're giving people the gospel, but when you find a man and his wife and they're eating their chicken on the front porch, they're having dinner, you kind of hate, you hate to interrupt, but you got the gospel. And I'm talking to them and they said, well, Caleb, since you're here, let us ask you this question. They said, what should you be tithing from? Before taxes? or after taxes. And I said, you guys shouldn't be tithing anyway. If we don't tithe, how are we going to give back to God? You determine what you're going to give to God. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. It's a free will offering. This is an Old Testament idea. You won't find it taught inside the New Testament. Why is, that's easy, y'all. This is one of the easiest things you can get over, but why is it such a big deal? Because the pastors care about money more than they care about you. Now, we had a man who came from Thomas Road, and he visited with us one night during this tent. And he likes what we do. He says the platform. He likes that we have an open mic tonight for our visitors to ask a question. He said, I like that. We have debates on TV and the Internet. He says, I like that. He said, but it is not advantageous for these pastors to come out and talk Bible with you. Why? They don't have the truth, and if they're shown to not have the truth, their tithe is leaving the building. Why is it the case that here we are, this group that we are, and nobody answers us? And all we're saying is show me with the Bible and we'll change. Fighting over women preachers, which is not authorized in the New Testament. You know, I'm coming back to I, I said it earlier in the tent meeting. Somebody said, what y'all got a problem against women? I have no problem with women, and I say mothers, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, you have the capacity to change the world. You give these little girls information to grow up by, and I'm saying it's not just little girls, the boys, you're a mom. You're changing the world. You are their world until they get to such an age and you're installing these principles in them, and you basically say, no, 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 that's not good enough. I got to preach on Sunday. I'm sorry. You don't have any New Testament authority for a woman preacher. It is outright, in 1 Corinthians 14, forbidden. <sighs> Fighting for their traditions and opinions which are not taught in the New Testament. There's so much stuff that people will hound you about that they would just, it's not biblical, and it has nothing to do with Jesus. And for the life of me, I'm saying I can't understand that. What are we wanting? Here's our close tonight, y'all. You see the fighting, right? You said that's bad when Israel did it. Well, we're doing it today, and nobody bats an eye at it. Here's tonight's appeal after two weeks. I'm asking you to be a saved Christian, not a traditional sectarian. Really follow your Bible. In Acts 2, verse number 40, with many other words that he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. You play a part in your salvation. You have to obey the gospel. Acts 2, 38, what did he tell these people? He told them, Save yourselves. How? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. If you want your sins washed away, let's talk about this, y'all. Man. Guilt, I'm saying guilty consciences, is no joke. And the people who live, and I'm saying your regrets, and everybody's are different. Let's talk about this. Some people, they have lived really hard lives, and they got some regrets. And if they found out what your regrets are, they might say, well, that ain't nothing. Boy, it's something to you, isn't it? Why don't you just forget it? You say, I wish it was that easy. It should be that easy. If you would be baptized into Christ, 
and really have faith in your Savior that he's washing your sins away, I would hope it could be that easy. Let's keep going. What you need to do tonight, here's our appeal. Here's what the Bible is asking you to do. We're inviting the community through the Bible to stop being some type of man-made creed, some type of man-made church. When I knock on your door for this tent, I shouldn't be having so many people in the community come to the door and say, I'm Baptist, no thank you. I'm Methodist, no thank you. I'm Presbyterian, no thank you. We glory in our division, and you know that God hates it. So what do we do? We need to have one church in town, that's it. I am not talking about your building. I don't care about the building. God doesn't care about your building. Do you know that God had a temple in Jerusalem and he wiped it out? He does not care about the structure. He cares about what we are teaching to the community. He cares about how we are worshiping him together in our assemblies. Let's pause again. We had a lady door knocking the other day and she said, two weeks from now she's coming to visit at 823. She has her own church that she goes to in Eden and she's not feeling it anymore. She's not, just not feeling it. Why? She said, a couple Sundays ago, they had me work in the security team, and she said, the speaker showed up an hour late. And she said, not only was he an hour late, once he got there, he kept us till 2.30. I tell you, that is inconvenient, isn't it? You show up late, you don't show up. If you show up late an hour to the job, go home. He showed up late, and then <laughs> he kept him till 2.30. And you know what I just, I don't find people saying? That's inconvenient, right? We're late. He's late. We stayed late. What I don't hear people saying is, they're teaching false doctrine, and I'm tired of it. We, we do all this tradition that we can't back up with the Bible, and I'm tired of it. We had a man visiting us in Danville. He was Baptist during Corona. He was visiting with us for like five months. He left. He went back to his Baptist church. He came back the next Sunday after that, and we said, hey, we thought you were gone. Good to see you again. He said, well, I went back to my Baptist church, but they keep trying to get me to wear a mask, and I'm tired of that. And Mark asked him, you're not tired of false doctrine? <laughs> There's no Baptist church in the Bible. Faith, salvation by faith only, not in the Bible. He said, you're not tired of the false doctrine? <sighs> That's what he does, right? When he, he's with us, he laughs with us. We love him. But he knows he's got to change. He's already left one sect for another. He used to be Presbyterian. Then he turned Baptist. He needs to be a Christian. We love him, and he knows it. Acts 2, 47, praising God, having faith with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We need one church in town, any town, all over the place. We need unity in this community. Add unto them about 3,000 souls. What did they add them to? Added to the church. What is that? Acts eleven twenty six. if you're in the church, he says they assembled themselves a year with the church, taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. If you're in the church, you're a Christian. Look at this, Romans 16, 16, it's the churches of Christ. How to know tonight if this applies to you, right? A lot of people will say, but I have been baptized and I go to church. If you came in here this evening and if anybody would have greeted you and y'all shook hands and someone said, where do you go to church? And you said, I go to Forest Hill Presbyterian. I go to First Baptist. I go to Uptown Methodist. I go to St. Joe Catholic. You're not a Christian. How can you say that? Your church came way after the New Testament. And Jesus did not start it. Some man did. You know, we're going to have all these lessons on DVD. And we'll go through a lot of these sects that we have today, and we'll show you who started them. we show you what they teach and how it's different from the Bible. If you came in here tonight and your answer is not, I am a Christian, I am a member of the body of Christ, you need to do something tonight. Because people who are outside the body of Christ and who are religious, but they're not Christians, they are guilty, Proverbs 6, 19, of sowing discord, making the division. How'd they make division? Matthew 15, 3, they've been pressing their traditions rather than teaching the Bible. We're done. What do you need to do? We got the front row open. That row is open. That front row is open. If you're somebody and you need to be a Christian rather than a traditional sectarian, we're just saying you come forward, we talk to you, we can immerse you this evening, 
you will come up out of the water a child of God, you will come up a Christian, a member of the body of Christ, and you can start helping us reach the community because the community is very, very divided, and you know it. What are we doing about it? Before he comes up here and leads this song, and this song is for you to think about. You say, I know I'm not a Christian. You're thinking in your head, I know I'm not a Christian, and I know that I'm not a member of the Church of Christ. And you say, and I know that I got a whole bunch of tradition in me that I got to wash out. Then you need to do something about it tonight rather than drive home and stay lost. This has been a two-week unity meeting. It's been an education meeting. And we saved for our final night to talk about going to the promised land together and doing it with as little infighting as we possibly can. Will you please help us? Help us stop the fighting by getting back to the Bible only so we can be Christians only. We love you. Thank you for coming out. If you're a visitor here, honestly, you made our night. This is our last night. You made our night. Thank you for using your limited time to come out here. You have made our night. Let us help you become a Christian by doing exactly what the Bible says. Think about it as we stand and sing this song.